Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 96. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Both back from our travels. Oh yeah, we've been all over the world, haven't we, Dan? Well, I've been on my honeymoon for a couple of weeks and obviously through the magic of podcasting, we didn't miss a show. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> no one could tell. Uh, but I've been in uh, Nice in the south of France. I did a trip to Reykjavik in Iceland on my honeymoon. I did, you know... I didn't let the side down. On my final day in Reykjavik, I found this amazing little arcade. Oh, of course, yeah. Even in Iceland, you're going to find games. <laughs> I posted a picture on our Facebook. As soon as we walked in there, Samantha's like, God, I knew you'd find something like this. <laughs> so a little like Mortal Kombat, okay, cabinet there, Street Fighter 2, loads of little pinball tables. Sweet. It was amazing. But, I mean, you've obviously been away as well. And just before we get into you know what we're going to be talking about in this week's show, we were chatting before about the fact that I've actually had a bit of a digital detox. Yeah, it wasn't your phone in a drawer... By itself, you know, it wasn't being checked every day. Well, I wasn't going to bring my phone at all, but obviously I went straight in my honeymoon after Play Expo, so I had all my stuff with me, so I couldn't yeah. leave it. I had to take it at the airport. But I uninstalled Facebook, uninstalled Twitter, uninstalled my email apps, everything pretty much apart from text and the web browser. So no alerts popping up on my phone. And in fact, I did leave it turned off in a drawer for a couple of days. So you were living in the moment, Dan. You were actually there and present. Yeah, I literally just used it as a camera when I was yeah, away. Yeah. That's about all, you know, Samantha would put it in a handbag. And if I need to take a picture of something, I'd take it out. But it was actually quite liberating not to, you know, just to go out for a drink or dinner and not have your phones on the yeah, table. I've been, I've been doing a similar thing because I got this app, which was called Moment, um, which basically shows you how many times you're checking your phone. And it was like... <laughs> A full solid five hours. Of Why on earth did you download that? Oh, God, it, it was just, just to see, you know, because it's the first thing that I check. You know, I've got my alarm on my phone, so yeah. I wake up in the morning, my alarm goes off, what do I do then? Check Facebook. And, and it's just a, a bad cycle, and I'm just looking through the same crap. Yeah. You know, so um, I've decided to get, I'll go old school, 3210 and a paper calendar, and, and actually they've got these new uh, lithium batteries. You put them in the 3210 and that thing will last for like so in the a old school, month. In the old school Nokia? Yeah, yeah, okay. you can put that in. <laughs> See, I've actually got an old Nokia 3310 still like lying around somewhere. But, I mean, I, I did actually go back to using that briefly when I broke my iPhone. Yeah. It's the only phone I had lying around. And again, it was kind of like this experience when I was away. It was just like, I'm not getting nagged all the time. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like, you know, if they want to contact me, they can ring me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so I've got this... Um, I've just downloaded this moment thing, so I've started tracking this. I guess it needs to be on then, does it? To yeah, yeah, it just runs okay. in the background. And okay, it, always allow. And it will give you the kind of average on a day. Right, tracking is go, so zero minutes. We'll, I'll report back next week okay. on how much I've used my phone. God, that sort yeah. of thing. This is going to be depressing, isn't it? <laughs> but obviously we have been on our travels, lots of stuff going on. And when we were in play uh, in Manchester at the Play Expo event last month, we had loads of amazing panels there. If you did come down and say hi to us, lovely to meet you. And of course, on the Sunday, we did have this really, I think, once in a lifetime panel. When are you ever going to get this bunch of people together on one stage ever again? Never. This is absolutely crazy. And I think it's a great tribute to the Spectrum. And it comes as this film, Memoirs of a Spectrum Addict, comes out. And, you know, all these guys are in the film. And Andy Remick, who created the film, is actually on stage as well. So... It's kind of like a film Q&A, and I, we, we recommend this film to absolutely everyone. It's really good. Well, on this panel, because we, we had to cram more seats onto the stage, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. On the retro hour stage at play. And people were, like, joining halfway through, you know, because everyone was travelling from all over the country. But let me name a few of the people who were on stage. Andrew Hewson. Oh, yeah. Who's not been on stage at one of these Spectrum things for actually years? His son, you know... That's Rob probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rob yeah. told him to come along. John Hare, he kind of comes in at the end. He was Steve a little bit Turner like Turner as well. Yeah, yeah, from Graf Gold. A lot of people we've had on this show before, actually. Rich Stevenson, Simon Butler, Jim Bagley. You couldn't have a Spectrum talk without baggers. No. Uh, Mark R. Jones. So these guys were all on stage, and really, we just sat them down before we showed a bit of this movie and asked them to share a few memories about the Spectrum or what it meant to them and a few of their memories about each other. And God bless them, the Spectrum crowd. They're not the most kind of out there guys so you know we ask a few questions and uh we kind of leave it to the audience to ask a few questions and they're they're not really on it but um you can <laughs> I think tell they're starstruck they were all starstruck and they all seem to be really interested and focused on it yeah. you know so i i think it's great and more people that can hear this the better absolutely so um andy remick is a guy who's behind this movie it's called memoirs of a spectrum addict if you want to check it out you've watched a film haven't you oh yeah yeah it's Absolutely fantastic. And this is a huge film. Like, the bonuses that you get with it, they're 45-minute interviews with other guys. So yeah. it's like... 
I think it's around three hours or three hours 45 for the whole thing, like the whole package. And he's making a second movie. Well, yes, this, uh, I will mention this in our news items. It'll be our first item today. OK, so uh, this Spectrum panel that we did at Play Expo Manchester, if you were there and you want to hear it again, or, you know, if you didn't get to check it out and you're a big fan of the Spectrum, do not miss this. Our Memoirs of the Spectrum Attic panel, live from Play Expo in Manchester, is coming up in around half an hour from now. Now, our events calendar hasn't ended in 2017 yet. We thought, oh, you know, it's near the end of the year now. That'll be it till next year, surely. Well, we've been doing all these events recently. So we've been doing Amiga 32 Germany, which was just an insanely fantastic event. I know we mentioned it last week, but we kind of recorded that before <laughs> <laughs> the event. So We're in I'll, the magic, Revy. Yeah, <laughs> I'll talk about it a bit more. Um, we had about over 500 people there and everyone we met was just absolutely wonderful. I've put a video on our YouTube channel which mm. is an actual little report and we got a few gifts Dan as well we were given look at this lovely board here you what's go. that then that's uh, looks quite a sexy little circuit board in your hand there it's it's from John Hurtle this is diagram.com which is his website and this is the Amiga 040 accelerator board okay he's managed to print a new version that can fit an 060 so you put, you put that in like a, an Amiga 4000 that makes it go really quick really quick <laughs> okay. yeah and it's a lot cheaper than the 060s which are usually kind of 300 <laughs> quid for these cyber storms so are they releasing is he releasing those then will people yeah, to buy yeah. Them? I, okay. I think he'll release them but at the moment it's just the bare board but it looks very beautiful yeah well I wasn't at Amiga 32 because I was on my honeymoon but I watched that video that you did um, when I got back yesterday and it, I couldn't believe the turnout there Oh, it was it was so rammed. Everyone was going, okay, Ravi, take this picture, mate. Dan jealous. <laughs> Send it him, you know. I did see someone watching one of my videos on, uh, on, yeah. on a screen there. Yeah, no. Which was quite nice. It, it was just fantastic. For me, it was really like, it was a, a revival of Amiga and I felt all the people here, they've all had their own individual little hardware projects yeah. and they've, there's been battles in the past with different groups, everything, but everybody came together to make this scene bigger and... Just through the passion of the nerds, it's it's got bigger, and we've really lost our crown in the UK. I, I do think Germany and Poland seem to be a mega Valhalla at the moment. We might need to put on a show, an Amiga show in in the UK. Oh, well, we point. should do something yeah. in the UK. I think uh, we've got something planned, haven't we, Dan? We have actually. Now, obviously, when you were over there, I mean, just to quickly wrap up Amiga Thirty Two. I mean, what were the other highlights? I know you're hanging out with the Vampire guys as well. Oh, you... just seeing Jeff Porter on yeah. stage. You know, explain who Jeff is for people. Who Jeff is the mode. guy behind the Amiga Five Hundred. You know, right, that was yeah. his baby. And in America, he kind of did not see the massive success. And then he comes to Germany, and his socks are blown off. He's standing <laughs> on stage, and there's. 500 people in front of him and he just can't believe there's still interest in this uh, little machine that he made. And I believe there was free booze. Oh, well, this was... <laughs> Talk <laughs> I, about highlights I'm not here, sure Robbie. if this was the VIP <laughs> event or not, but um, basically the Pilsner was free, so uh, we had a very joyous yeah. time by the end of it. You were there till about, what, two or three in the morning? <laughs> yeah, and we had an extra hour as well, so it was two about four in the morning. Dude, well, you were hanging out with David Pleasance, of course, our uh, good friend who was the former managing director of Commodore UK. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now working at Friend Up. And when you were out there, you actually said to David, you know, we, we should do something together in the UK, you know, yeah, maybe totally. an event or something. And obviously when we're at play, we, we always bump into the guys from uh, the Retro Computer Museum in Leicester. Mm. So you've worked your magic and you've organised a little event this month. Well, yeah, it's going to be fabulous. This is at the Retro Computer Museum in Leicester, and it's on the 25th. And what time is it starting, Doug? So this is Saturday the 25th of November. Not far away now. Um, you can get your tickets. We'll put links in our show notes at theretrohour.com. So it's going to be, we're going to be there. It starts around 10.30 in the morning. And uh, David Pleasance is going to be there, who, you know, you may have heard David on the show before, good friend of ours. Um, he used to run Commodore in the UK, essentially. Yeah, and he was kind of there at the end when they had all these crazy projects. Like, they had this one, CD1200, which is a legendary one, and the Leicester Museum actually have one of the only ones in existence. Yeah. So we're reuniting the uh, guy with his hardware. <laughs> but David also launched the CD32, didn't he, with Chris oh, yeah, Evans. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's behind stuff like the Batman pack, and obviously he's doing a new book at the moment, um, Commodore The Inside Story. So we're going to be there. Uh, if you haven't seen David live before, he's such a good speaker. And so this, many this place is a really nice place as well. Leicester... Uh, museum is just like a group of people in a living room 
that's just full of wicked game systems and everyone's really friendly and, you know, you can just come sit down, have a chat, have a little drink or something in the evening. It's, like, fantastic. Is it like going around your mate's house and just playing games? Totally, and stuff like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but your mate is the richest boy that has all the best <laughs> consoles in the world. <laughs> so, yeah, this is coming up very soon, guys. So I'd advise you get this sorted and get it booked in. So Saturday, 25th of November, the Retro Computer Museum in Leicester in association with the Retro Hour podcast featuring David Pleasance and we're going to be there, like, you know, well into the evening. I think the bar's going to be open on the night. We're all going to be gaming. Oh, well, well and... there's a load of good curry places nearby, so we might end up there. You know, well up for that. So we'll put all that information in our show notes at theretrohour.com and on our Facebook and Twitter. And hopefully we will see you there. Right then, before we get into our Spectrum panel, let's just uh, thank the people who, of course, do allow us to come in and do the Retro Hour podcast week in, week out. And that is the really generous people who find their place in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Now, to get a place in the Hall of Fame, all you've got to do is make a little donation into the running of the show. Now, we have a little PayPal button. We also have a Bitcoin link that you can donate via as well. Head to our website, theretrohour.com. Any little amount of money, a pound, a penny, a euro, tenner, whatever you can afford, it all goes back into the running of this show and will enable us to keep doing this throughout 2018 and do more live events and that kind of thing too. So this week, thank you so much to Matt Cooper. Charles Aswood. Peter Dimitriovsky. And Paul Edwards. Thank you so much for your donations, guys. Really means a lot to us. And you can do the same. Head to our website, theretrohour.com. Now, obviously, this Spectrum panel that you're going to be hearing very soon is to um, celebrate the release of that movie, Memoirs of a Spectrum Addict. But Andy Riemann, who made this film, he's not just sitting back now. He's actually making a second movie that's just finished on Kickstarter. He's a machine. (laughs) Can you believe it? Got got that funded that quickly. And this movie's got a wicked name. Load Film 2. Like it. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And this is going to include interviews with uh, Mel Croucher, yeah. who we've had on the show, and John Rittman as well. Just absolutely fantastic We've had guys. him on the show as well, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah, we have. And also, ooh, Andy C. Spencer from the Retro Computer Museum. Oh, it so. all ties together nicely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And this will be a total new documentary. So as you know, it's not going to contain any pieces of old footage or anything re-pieced together. You know, this is a brand new one. And I think it was 13,000 and he's just been funded on that. So Yeah, just finished in it on November 5th. Um, but, you know, speaking to Andy when we're at play, he's got such a passion for the spectrum, hasn't he? And, and you oh, can tell totally. he's, like, he's like a kid in a candy shop when you look at him like when he's around all these people. Yeah, yeah, he's just loving it. And uh, you could probably tell that in this interview that's going to happen later as well. So if you want, there's actually a little trailer for the film, isn't there, that they put on Kickstarter. Yeah. If you want to find out more about that, we'll link that up in this week's show notes at theretrohour.com. Now let's get back to the early days of the internet. Mm-hmm. What year did you first get online, do you think? Oh my God, I can't even remember. I know Yahoo Chat was around and... Uh, late 90s then, was it mid to late 90s? Mid to late 90s, yeah, but then I remember Netscape and, uh, was it Mosaic? Mosaic, yeah. yeah I did really a bit did. of... Mosaic browsing back in the day, so it must have been much earlier. Yeah, that was about 94, 95, I think, yeah. Mosaic was big. Well, that was around the time I probably got online about 95, 96 for the first time. But obviously mainstream media didn't catch up quite as quickly on the web as us geeks did, for example. Yeah, it, it was kind of strange, you know, even on TV, they wouldn't read out, like, web addresses or anything. They kind of ignore it, you know, this world we're not going to enter yet. Well, there's even, like, you can watch them on YouTube, like, news reports in America. There's that famous one, what is the internet? Where they're all <laughs> yeah. talking about it. It's hilarious. But, I mean, if you're talking about stuff that you used to watch and listen to and that in the 90s, Pete Tong's Essential Mix on Radio 1. Oh, well, Pete Tong was one of the original guys that started dance music and Balearic sound in the UK. So yeah. he, he, you know, brought it over. And uh, kind of bought his party back from Ibiza and <laughs> took it <laughs> to the Danny UK. Danny Rampling and all yeah, those guys. Yeah. I mean, I've uh, you know I've never talked about it on the show before, but I, I spent several years as a club DJ I used to play yeah. Gatecrasher and you know, a bit of a house music DJ back in the day. And I used to listen to Pete Tong's Essential Mix religiously every week on Radio One. Oh yeah, he's he's a god to me, Pete Tong is how. Yeah. Well, here's a little moment from 1995 when Radio One <laughs> had just launched their first website. And Pete Tong gives out the homepage address on the Essential Mix on Radio 1. As he reluctantly gives it out. That's... Let's have a listen. Many thanks to Eric Powell for an excellent selection of tunes. And as he packs up his box there, we'll just take a little look at what he played during the last couple of hours and provide a list of it in this coming week's Update magazine, the next edition of Mix Mag. And we'll post it out there on the BBC homepages of the internet. And I keep saying that and not giving you the address. And I do get a lot of inquiries, so it's very complicated. But here it comes. HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.bbcnc.org.uk forward slash 
BBC TV forward slash Radio 1 forward slash P slash Tong forward slash Index full stop HTML. I know it doesn't make sense, but if you've got a computer and you're out there on the internet, you will understand what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and the background music makes it so... Oh, How quaint so does that sound now? Yeah. We've come a long way, haven't we? So I, I Forward do slash P, forward slash Tom. <laughs> Their structure must not have been good back then. God. And I've tried the website. It doesn't work anymore, unfortunately. No. <laughs> this was yeah, the BBC Networking Club, it used to be called. But yeah, I think that just really demonstrates, you know, how far we've come in just like, well, just over 20 years, it's like... Totally, and his, his attitude's so flippant to it as well. He's like, oh, you might find some interesting stuff on the home pages. He calls them home pages as well, yeah. Yeah, if you've got one of those computer things on the internet. Yeah, so, yeah, so if you do want to hear that audio again, I'll put it in this week's show notes at http <laughs> colon forward slash forward slash www.theretrohour.com forward slash index.html. Does that work? Uh, maybe. <laughs> now, did you have a Game Boy back in the day? No, I did not, and I always wanted one, but I would emulate Game Boy games on my Amiga, like I said. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, you used to get ROMs, and actually Game Boy ROMs would fit on a floppy usually. So, yeah. yeah, wasn't the Game Boy, it was like a Z80 device, wasn't it? It was a uh, yeah, yeah, Zilog. Yeah, so it wasn't like, you know, it was just pretty much like an 8-bit computer, essentially, in a, a black and white one as well, like that. I guess it didn't have a lot of processing power. I always wanted one, they looked great. Well, I remember my friend Sean, he got a... Um, he got a Game Boy probably Christmas 1990, and I remember he like come around, we play Tetris on it like all day. It was like, yeah, yeah loved it. But um, obviously, having a cartridge based system, if you haven't got stuff like Everdrives and all that, the Game Boy is actually a system that you don't get a lot of new games published for in, ter- mm, in terms yeah. of actual physical releases. I mean, there are like ROMs and that you can download and all that kind of thing. But now, there is a new game that works on uh, the original Game Boy to the uh, GBASP and the Super Game Boy as well. Oh, because I remember all of those colour ones and Game Boy Advance and stuff, yeah. Well, this new game... But this, this plays on the original as yeah, well, then. Yeah, it plays okay, on the cool. early one, you know, that kind of like a green matrix screen. Yeah, yeah. And the game is called Sheep It Up. <laughs> Sheep It Up. <laughs> I like that name. <laughs> it, actually, it actually looks hilarious. There is a couple of clips that you can check out online. So, essentially, you play a sheep that has to kind of climb up the top of the screen by flying up and sticking his back to Velcro strips. It looks exactly like Doodlebug, but like Game Boy and Sheepified. <laughs> more, more ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but this is actually you know, a proper printed manufactured Game Boy game that you can play in your original um, system. It's got the, you know, it's, even if you look at the cartridge, it's got, like, the original logo there. It says game. That's really cool. And, like, you know, yeah, he's printed it. It comes with a protective case and everything. Mm-hmm. And it's $15. Yeah, which is not bad at all, is it, for a new <laughs> game? So I don't know where he's actually got these printed and manufactured from. <laughs> it's a load of old carts and gone over them. I, I, yeah, God knows, because I assume you'd have to get a new circuit board in there. Or you'd have to flash it somehow. Or, God knows. Even get the moulding process for the cases and that if they're not three D printed. But you know, yeah. it's um, Cat Skull and that Ludo Science, like the teams behind it. But you know, a brand new Game Boy game actually looks like the kind of game that would work well on that system because it's quite simplistic. It mm. looks quite fun and the graphics, it, it is quite silly. Yeah. <laughs> so and at fifteen dollars, especially this time of year, if you you know maybe got a Game Boy lying around, you want something new for it, you know, in your, in your Christmas stocking, might be worth a look. And speaking of kind of updates of classics. I think this kind of ties in quite well to uh, this week's episode. Someone actually did like a, a homebrew version of the Spectrum. Yeah, totally. Like, this is back in the day, was it? Oh, this was this was back in the 80s. You know, um, R- Romania was under communism, so they kind of couldn't, you know, buy and choose their own computer. It would be the government yeah. one that you'd have to use in probably a, an official sanctioned place. So these guys would, uh, you know, find the old... Uh, Z80 processors and kind of build their own version of the Spectrum. And they said, you know, it was really freeing from the government because you'd kind of, your whole life, you'd be set on this system of what you'd have to do. And then you're like, oh, I've built my own computer. I can program whatever I want, you know. So it kind of gave them a bit of freedom, but it's just great, the whole story about it. It's on Ars Technica. And um, it's just great how they start to learn how to program and then they start to optimize the code eventually and you know there's this whole romanian spectrum industry that comes out of nothing and you know the guy says here i didn't care about cases most of the time the computer worked keep doing the accent i like it (laughs) (laughs) i don't care about the cases most of the time my computer worked with its parts all spread on the desk if it was broke i'd fix myself that's how we (laughs) used them back in the day yeah yeah that's it well this was called the cobra this system that he made then so essentially it was a homebrew spectrum 
Totally. And, you know, they'd hook it up to their TV. They'd also have a cassette player for storage. And this happened in a lot of countries. So actually in a lot of ex-communist countries. So Russia had their own homebrew spectrums, yeah. which you can see online, and they just look crazy. And the, they were saying there's also a few clone machines that they had anyway, so they'd take the old cases of them and they'd do like lots of mixing and matching. But this is a really interesting article. You should check it out. Absolutely. It's kind of like, you know, we probably took it a bit for granted that you could just walk into Dixon's and buy a computer of any model that you wanted. But yeah. it's, you know, in countries like that where it kind of a bit like Jurassic Park, life will find a way. Well, that's it. Well, you talk about any game that would be produced in a communist country would be part of the country's property. Yeah, well, Tetris, so, famously. So, yeah, Tetris. So, you know, they were all these kids were playing Tetris on their games, boys, and they were probably, like, funding a bit of the Cold War on the <laughs> yeah. uh, Russia side, you know. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? But yeah. It is. I mean, it, these are essentially, yeah, it says illegal, illegal spectrums in Romania. So, yeah. But I love Ars Technica as a website anyway. I mean, they do some really in-depth, interesting articles. So definitely worth a read. I'll ship that in this week's show notes as well. Definitely worth a look in. And speaking, I'm sorry about my Romanian accent if I've offended any <laughs> Romanian people. I'm very sorry. I'll wait for the angry tweets to come G- in. Generic Eastern European accent. <laughs> yeah, I apologise. Branded as that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was good, Ravi. Was good. <laughs> well, speaking of making things yourself at home, people still do that today. Have you seen this guy who's made his own version of the Nintendo Switch that plays thousands of old school games? Oh, cool. Wow. I'm, I'm just looking at this kind of... He's got a gif mm-hmm. of him putting it together and... It, it looks nice on the outside, but the inside, I think I could spot a Raspberry Pi in there and there's a little HDMI out. Actually, this wouldn't be that hard to do, would it? Yeah, it's just, I mean, you, you, you've got eagle eyes, Ravi. You've obviously spotted that. It is a Raspberry Pi that's in here. And this is a guy called uh, Tim Linquist. And he's posted a video. He's done like a blog explaining how he did it. And there's also a time lapse video that you can watch on YouTube as well. And it is essentially a Raspberry Pi uh, running an emulator with other 50 systems on there. Something like Retro Pi he's got running on here. But the, the interesting bit is he's kind of wired it up into a case with kind of joystick controllers on the side that looks like a, a Nintendo Switch. And I can imagine he's got the nice micro switches in there and stuff, so it'll probably have that feel. He's got a cooling system built in there as well. He's also got a massive battery, 10,000 milliamp hours in there, rechargeable battery. The switch, <laughs> is a, the switch has only got a 4,000 wow. MH, MH, yeah. MAH one, so it's got two USB ports in there, HDMI, and also you can output it into a bigger screen by the HDMI port as well, and cool. there's also a nice LCD in there too. So um, it, it doesn't say how much it cost him to make it, but... I do think it is pretty cool. I mean, you could just kind of do it on a, an iPad or something, I guess. I mean, it's not quite as slick. But I think, you know, it's always cool to see people doing homebrew kind of systems like this. Yeah, very nice. And kind of fitting it into that form factor. I and guess I, I guess it's like a form factor that's never existed before, is it? The Switch, a tablet with a thing on the side, you know. It's kind of a new thing for gaming. Well, these are not removable, unfortunately. We ah, stuck to okay. it. It's called it the uh, Nintendo RP. So there you go. <laughs> nice. Nice work. So if you want to check that out, I'll put that in our show notes at theretrohour.com as well. Now, before we get into this week's uh, massive specky panel talk from Play Expo in Manchester, recorded last month, we always love getting, you know, new games that kind of throw back to the old days. Mm-hmm. And you actually picked up a Commodore 64, didn't you, at Play Expo? Oh, God, yeah. I totally forgot. This is crazy because I bought one actually from the Leicester guys and they, yep. they sold it at a very reasonable price, £30. Uh, I checked if the SID chip was in there. <laughs> yeah. And it's, um, a, it's a bread bin model as well. Bread bin model, there. yeah. And it had this little label missing, so I picked one of those up. But the problem was... I could I was going around Manchester, so I couldn't put it in my bag. So I go, oh Dan, can you just put this in your boot? You know, you went away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my car was at Manchester Airport for three weeks in the car park. So your Commodore sixty four has been in the boot of my car. Yeah, just alone. You know, no attention. But I'm gonna totally do it up, and maybe I'll do a little restoration video online or something. Well, speaking of the C sixty four, this this is quite interesting. It's a new PC game called Black Jewel, and the idea is it's kind of inspired by those old school. Commodore 64 games. Kind of graphically um, reminds me a bit of something like a Barbarian or mm. Girls and Ghosts. I mean, it yeah. looks a bit like that as well. And you can actually just download this. It's only $2. You know, you can get it dirt wow. cheap, this thing. And check out the music, for example. That's got that Sid kind of nasty it's, it's that kind of repetitive <laughs> sign stuff. Really good. Oh, yeah. Lovely. And it's got um, options to play using a keyboard or a joypad. Uh, also got CRT emulation in there as well. 
five bosses, five different zones. It's also, the art's very like that old school Commodore 64 pixel art. I like oh, that's too, cool. One. It sounds like a Rob Hubbard song or something. Yeah. Nice, so this is for the PC. Yeah, available for the PC. Um, you can play it on Windows. Apparently people have been saying it does work on um, Ubuntu via... Um, buy a wine, you know, if you use it on Linux. But oh, yeah. it's, it's literally $2 to download it. You stand with the EXE. Not on Steam yet, but you can just get it from their website. Uh, that'll link up in this week's show notes as well. So uh, it's cool to see like new games inspired by the classics, I think. Oh, definitely. I love these classic star ones. And uh, there's this really good little bit of hardware that's come out, uh, which is called the Steam Link. You okay. should check it out. It's only $14 or £14 at the moment from Steam. And what you can do is you can stream any PC to your TV and have your controller there. So I've got my little Steam Link at home with my Xbox One controller, and I can play all my retro titles via Steam. Wow. Just on, on my own TV. 40, only, 14, 14 quid. That's yeah, 14 bad. quid. It's not cheap, uh, not bad at all. Is I it? remember they had like those Steam boxes and stuff, but they were quite pricey, weren't they? But, yeah, uh, no, this is Steam Link. It's okay. really cheap. And even to the point that a few RPG games are selling for £7, and they're adding the box on for free. So. <laughs> free hardware included. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been playing, you know, we got Thimbleweed Park, um, obviously. Yeah. God, when did that come out now? Like, start of this year, was yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I... I, I, on the Switch, were you playing it? Well, I got, I've got it on the Switch because I, I went away for three weeks. And I thought, well, I want something to play on the plane. So it's like, you know, I've been flying all over, yeah, obviously. Yeah. I must have spent about like 10, 12 hours on the plane in total over a couple of weeks. So I thought, well, Samantha was forced to sleep on the plane. So I'll put, get it on the Switch. But obviously, so I've been playing it on Steam. And then I actually got it on the PlayStation. And now I keep starting the game again. Oh, it? man, you've, got, like, new platform, you've so. got to rush it. Keep rushing those levels. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm probably about halfway through now on the uh, on okay. the Switch, but it has been really cool playing. If you made me think, then you mentioned you know, the Sierra games and all that kind of out on yeah, Steam, yeah. aren't they? So it would be a good way to play those adventure games on the telly, actually, rather than having to download it on every different system. So. Yeah, totally. Right then, well, thank you for checking out episode number 96 of the Retro Hour podcast. Do not forget, coming up in a couple of weeks' time, at the Retro Computer Museum in Leicester um, happening on Saturday, November 25th. We're going to be there. David Pleasance giving loads of stories about Commodore and the Amiga. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of alcohol flowing in the evening as well. Totally. And we've got a lot more events coming up for you guys. We're, we're just confirming guests and people at the moment, but we're going to be announcing some very, very good stuff coming up in the next month. So. Absolutely. Just keep an eye on those on our website, theretrohour.com. Right then, we'll see you next Friday. Yeah. Listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time for this week's special guest. And we haven't just got one guest; we haven't just got two. How many have we got? We've got about eight. <laughs> <laughs> this was recorded at Play Expo in Manchester, the massive Spectrum Sunday talk about the new movie Memoirs of the Spectrum Addict. Andrew Hewson, John Hare, Steve Turner, Rich Stevenson, Simon Butler, Jim Bagley, Mark R. Jones. This is amazing. Check this out if you love the Spectrum. Enjoy the next half an hour. Now, I'm sure there are many people here who don't need an introduction, but it would be quite nice if we start with you, Jim. If you guys yep. just introduce yourselves and maybe talk a bit about your involvement in the Spectrum scene and your history. Oh, okay. Um, Jim Bagley. I've been in the games industry now for 32 years. Started on the Spectrum doing a um, Mike Singleton game called Throne of Fire. And I've worked on Roadrunner, Midnight Resistance, Cabal, Hudson Hawk, Guts loads and loads of ocean games um, and I've really enjoyed it and I'm also doing the Spectrum Spectrum Next which the boards will be coming out for the backers very shortly and the um, the full case should be there for January, the end of January. I have no idea how to follow that. <laughs> um, I'm, my, my name is Andy Spencer and I run the Retro Computer Museum in Leicester um, and it's down to these guys that really that we run the Retro Computer Museum. Um, we, if you've never visited, please do. Um, we, we've got 40 or 50 machines always set up. We're here today with about 30 machines as well. Um, we, we try and keep this, this spirit alive with retro gaming on all the systems, especially the Spectrum though. Good afternoon. My name's uh, Andrew Hewson. Uh, I started on the ZX80 back in 1980 and of course graduated to the ZX Spectrum when it came out. Um, I started off by writing books, whereas most of the other people here were very much um, coders. And I ended up publishing a number of products, uh, some of which will be familiar to you even today. 
obviously from Graph Gold and people like that, and eventually moving on to do pinball products. Hi there, uh, my name's Richard Stevenson. Um, I'm a former developer. Um, I developed games uh, between 1984 and 2002. Uh, the first game I had published was by Firebirds, of course, Shorts Views. I seem to make a name for myself in budget games rather than for a lot of full price games. Uh, went on to work for companies like Alligator, uh, Gremlin Graphics, EA, um, Infogram. After coding on the Spectrum and Amstrad, I worked on games like Jungle Strike, Actua Soccer, Euro 96, and Premier Manager. Hello there, my name is Mark Howlett. Um, I can't really compete with these guys, but I'm a Spectrum fan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I've had a Spectrum since about 1983. Um, you might know me better on Twitter as Lord Ars. Uh, I'm in the film, I don't know why. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name's uh, Mark Jones, and I worked on, at Ocean Software in-house, mainly on the Spectrum, uh, between 87 and 1990. My name's Andy Remick. I had this stupid idea to make a film one day and find myself, bizarrely, sat on a stage with some of my gaming heroes um, of the early 80s. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Right now, I'm not sure what I got myself into. Um, but it's been a pleasure working with every single one of these amazing people uh, and plenty of people who, haven't, who are not here at this moment in time. Um, I hope you enjoy the film. Thank you. Hi, my, na hey, my name is Rob Shedwick. Um, I'm the least qualified to be sat up here because um, I'm not a coder or anything. I'm a musician. Um, I wrote the music for the film and I actually had an Amstrad, I'm sorry boys. <laughs> so, the way this is going to work is we're going to ask a few questions to the panel, you can answer at any point and we don't have to do it in an order. And then we're going to get some questions from the audience and we're going to show half an hour of the film. So, the first question is, was the first time you saw a Spectrum? Christmas 1984, uh, and then it became my addiction, hence the ne need to make the film. I think it's something that never left me, it's in my blood. Like Andrew, I started uh, on a ZX81, in fact prior to that on a NASCOM 2, um, and the Spectrum was just a, a natural progression as the ZX81 died out, um, and the Spectrum obviously came out as a full colour machine, uh, it was a natural way to go, and that was around 82 would it have been, I think, about 82. Uh, well, I remember it very clearly, um, the first time I got close up and personal was at a ZX Micro Fair, and I wonder how many people here remember the ZX Micro Fairs. Anyone go along to them? Um, thank you. There's somebody over there, yeah. Uh, they were wonderful events. Uh, a bit like this, only much smaller and a lot more money changing hands. Uh, we would go along there with, in my case, uh, books to sell, um, uh, little games for the ZX81, uh, Pilot, I, I remember. And people would be thrusting money, thrusting money at you. So I came across a Spectrum then, and of course the first thing you saw was that rubber key. Wasn't they, weren't, weren't they wonderful? Um, I, I first got into the Spectrum in 1984, after having a ZX81 prior to that, um, writing games in BASIC, and then started writing games on Specky in BASIC, and then thankfully to the um, the typing programs in the magazines, I don't know if everyone remembers them, where they'd have like a hex table for a function, and well, for a game or routine or whatever. And in this one magazine, there was a, like an, a white noise generator, just a dick sound. And then that, typing that in, because it was only small, I could use the instructions in the back of the manual, which had the, the, um, the byte value, and then what the actual instruction was. And then I, could, I, I went through the, converted the data that was the program into instructions and then sort of worked out how the instructions worked and then started writing machine code games and just building up from there. I first saw a Spectrum in about February 83 in WH Smith when I bought it. Um, I had a ZX81 before then, loved it. Um, sort of went the same way as Jim, but obviously never, never really <laughs> couldn't compare myself to Jim. So just recently I've actually understood Z80 finally. 
Uh, the first computer I ever saw was a ZX81, and my cousin used to have one, but it didn't really take, didn't really interest me enough to, to want to get one of my own. Um, he had one for a, for a while, and then friends at school were talking about computers that they'd got, ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, Vic 20s, Dragon 32s. Um, so I went round a few of my friends' houses t to test, to uh, see what their computers were like. And then I, s I went round Neil Anderson's house, a friend from school, and he had a Spectrum. And that was the one that real sort of got, got, my, got my interests going. And then a few days after that, my cousin, who had a ZX81, had just upgraded to a Spectrum. So that, that uh, made my mind up for me that that was the one that I decided to get. And then I, st I started badgering my parents to get me one, and they did. So Andy, why did this film need to be made? For me, personally, uh, it started off as a hobby project. Um, and then I realized that I was kind of hopefully creating an archive um, for the history of video gaming because, let's be honest guys, we're not getting any younger, you know, we'll all be, I'm the youngest here, what are you laughing at? So um, I thought that it would be beneficial in some way to the history of video gaming because, you know, you got I me mean, and my boys are down there now, they love, they love play. they're in the film actually. And they love playing Call of Duty and... <clears throat> in fact, actually, no, they're not, because they're not allowed to play Call of Duty. They, they love playing Minecraft and games like that on the PS4 and the Xbox. Um, so, um, hopefully, it's some kind of historical archive. How, how did you go about kind of tracking everybody down and getting everybody together? It was a pain in the ass. Um, lots of email communication, people putting me in touch with other people. Um, so, for example, Andrew's son, Rob, put me in touch with Andrew. I still think when we were filming with you, Andrew, you were a bit dazed and you didn't actually quite understand what you were doing <laughs> in terms of <laughs> what the output, what the end product was going to be. Um, lots of traveling around the country, meeting amazing people, absolutely everybody who was in the film. And here's Mr. Steve Turner. Have a round of applause for Steve. Graf Gold legend. Welcome, Steve. We'll get you a chair, Steve. Yeah, and just traveling around the country and meeting my childhood heroes. And I was just a gibbering wreck, to be honest. Um, therefore, I hid behind the camera and focused more on sound and uh, video, whilst my partner, Marie, did most of the questioning because she was unfazed because she didn't know any of these people. <laughs> so she was really chilled out. Well, Steve, I know you've just come in, but it would be quite interesting to find out your first memory of the Spectrum. Do you remember when you first saw one? I did. The first Spectrum I saw was actually mine. <laughs> but I, I put in the order as soon as I saw one in a magazine. I remember the box come in and eagerly ripping it open, and I was absolutely fascinated by this little thing. And I'd had a ZX80 before, so I, I knew it would be small and whatever, but it was a much more sophisticated package than the, the ZX80. It looked like a real computer to me and it had keys. Even though they were rubber, they were ones that you could press down rather than just a, a sort of membrane on. And uh, I wasted no time in firing it up and, and getting the, the first little test programs running on it. <laughs> I, th I think that's the important point about the Spectrum. You were asking why a film about the Spectrum. I think it's a breakthrough computer for the UK, isn't it? It's the first one that actually, there I see people nodding in the audience. It's the first one that was actually good enough. The ZX80 and the ZX81 were not quite there. there uh, That's right. The, the it was a real computer with color graphics that moved. Like, like the last one that, that I had, the ZX80, every time you ran a program, it went gray on the screen. And you thought, what's the good of that? I bought it to, to make games on, and, and it was darn near impossible. Although I did work out how to do it, and I got one asteroid going across the screen on the ZX-80, and that's about as far as I got when I saw the, the ZX-81 had come out, and I was just so disheartened, I gave up for, for a couple of years. <laughs> so do you think it's this kind of British love for the underdog, or the kind of, uh, you know, smaller system that has made people really take Spectrum to their hearts. How dare you call it an underdog? <laughs> it was a superior platform of the 80s. Well, that's my opinion anyway. <laughs> well, obviously, Andrew, you, you know, the Spectrum must have been very important to you and your company. Uh, yeah, the, the Spectrum was really the machine. I, I wrote two books for, for the Spectrum, which is what I was really into doing at the time. Uh, and of course, uh, 
as you all know, people started sending, and we had little ads in the, in the magazines, quite, quite big ads after a while, uh, people sent us games in to look at, which is what, how we got in touch with people like Steve. In fact, I remember 3D Space Wars coming, coming through from you uh, and, uh, on a cassette. And of course, looking at that uh, and playing it and thinking, this is very different. Um, uh, this is obviously the, the material we were getting through from people was of a variable standard. But 3D Space Wars sticks out in my mind. But it put us in touch with, uh, the machine put us in touch with all these programmers that we later worked with. So, uh, for the whole panel, what's your kind of favourite game or the game that impressed you the most on the Spectrum? I think for me, I think my favourite game of all time is probably Jet Set Willy. Jet Set Willy. Um, <laughs> favourite uh, game. I'm going to give Steve a, a big plug here. I think Avalon's really good, don't you? I mean, that was special yeah, Avalon. Uh, yeah. when it came Dragon out. Talk. I did like that one, but I'm not allowed to say that myself. <laughs> it's funny that... We used to look at other people's games, but we were so busy writing them, I didn't actually play many of other people's games. We, we kind of looked at them on the front of the magazines, read the magazines, I had a mate who'd bring some round and he'd just play them in front of us, but we hardly ever got to touch the joystick. And that was as far as we saw. The, the ones that impressed me were ones which were doing something different with the graphics. Like when the first isometric games came out, I can remember Ant Attack and saying, wow, this looks 3D, it looks really solid. And the way the little ants were, were manoeuvring, I thought, oh, that's good, I want to write that sort of stuff. Which I think was one of the things that led me on to doing Quasatron. That was my first one that I really felt I got a nice sort of solid background that you, 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 know, you felt you could reach out and grab. Has anyone got a memory of like, the most impressive thing you saw Spectrum do? Or just one moment that kind of blew your mind? For me, it was um, seeing Nightlaw, Christmas 1984, and just being blown away by the 3D graphics. You know, before then, I've been playing um, Jetpack and Manic Miner, and then to see this this thing that <laughs> at the time was reality. It's what kids must think when they play Call of Duty now. Like, you know, it's, it was just it was real. Well, mine would be uh, the first. There was a game called Turn Our Nog by a company called Gargoyle Games. Um, and before that come out, you were lucky, when you played a, an arca a game on your Spectrum, you were lucky if the character you controlled was more than one character big. And then to see this eight character high man striding across the screen with real, really realistic animation, um, that was one of the wow, first wow moments for me. So that, would, that was mine, Turn Our Knock by Gargoyle Games. Cool, so we're going to open it up to the audience for any questions you guys have. Hi there. Um... I just want to thank you all. I mean, you've all made so many brilliant games, but um, one game that sticks out in my mind from when I was a kind of young child, like in sort of last years of um, Spectrum, is a game called uh, Specimen, um, which I think Specimen, Andy, do you think you made? Um, I just wanted to know, kind of know, like in those last years, what was the kind of experience like getting stuff on like crash cover tapes in those like, last years of the machine? There's, there's always something from left field, isn't there, that you don't expect whatsoever. I know, right? <laughs> um, yes, I was a very, very amateur coder, um, bedroom programmer, and I wrote some adventures and a few arcade games, part basic, part machine code, uh, specimen <laughs> being one of them. I dealt with uh, Richard Eddy at Crash Magazine in, in getting them on the cover tapes. I did have a few close encounters um, and nearly got published by Cold Masters, an alternative, um, but it never happened. I'm just basically crap at maths. That's my problem. That's why I ended up as an English teacher. So, but it was, it was, I just enjoyed the creative process and I enjoyed learning to code badly. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that. Any more questions? I'd like to ask all of you this. How do you think after the release of the Vega, the Vega Plus has gone with the Kickstarter and the way it's actually gone slightly downhill and been put on pause. Do you think it's affected Spectrum as a brand or do you think it's still a viable company? It is, it is awkward. I know it's awkward. Who's, who's asking? asking? It, it, uh, Gamingguys.com. Well, yeah, yeah. It would have to be passed to me, this one, funnily enough. Um, with doing the Spectrum Next, just after the... Um, the Vega Plus issue, we were very dubious about how it would affect us 
Um, thankfully, you guys, the Spectrum community has been absolutely amazing. Um, stood by us, you know, backed, backed the whole project within a day and a half. And we were, we were thinking, we were talking to ourselves, and we were saying, there's no way we're going to make it to get the, uh, the, the actual goal, the first goal of two and a half, uh, 250k. And you know, not only did we beat it, we almost got it three times. It, it was amazing. So I don't think the Vega Plus issue has got anything to do with the like a downfall of the, the Spectrum community. It's still strong. It's I'd probably say it's stronger than ever. Um, it seems to have come together as a, a whole, and it's been absolutely amazing. I've loved working on the project um, since last year. I played Blackpool when um, I first met Enrique, and he he sort of introduced everyone to the Spectrum Next. And I asked him at the end, I said, where can I get a dev kit? And he, he gave me a dev kit and it, it all started from there. And I started adding things and, and then they brought me on the, on the team and everything. And like I say, the, the response from the community has been overwhelming. Um, I just ca I can't get over it. It's, and the fact that you know, it's gonna be here very soon, I'm really excited. And I can't wait for everyone else to get theirs as well. So yeah, I don't think it's it's affected the community as a whole. But we're strong, we can get over it. <laughs> Good answer, yeah. Can I just say there's um, a few members of the panel who seem to be quite self-deprecating in that obviously there's some big stars up here, you know, like Jim and Steve and Andrew. Um, it's people like Andy Spencer and Mark Howler who really keep the community going and uh, live and breathe the, the retro scene. And, and I think that's amazing, yeah, and, and I think they deserve a round of applause. And this is my mate Rob, who's a composer, who did all the music in the film. And, um, well, I think he's stunning, and he's kind of reimagined a lot of the tracks that were, were done in 8-bit, uh, was it, single channel, back in 1983 and things like that. So um, uh, I think... A nice little round of applause for Rob would be nice. And, and my two little boys who are sat over there, who you will see in the film in a moment. Woo. They're my little babies. Landy, let's talk about the process of making the movie. How long did it take you? A lot longer than I thought. Um, yeah. <laughs> two years, pretty much, I think, with some large gaps in between. I mean, the plan was originally maybe six, six months to a year. But there were kind of some personal issues that got in the way and the project extended. And then I had technical issues because I had the really bright idea of filming in 4K, which if anyone understands the kind of transfer rates of broadcast standard 4K files, they're just huge. And um, my computer broke several times, but um, I will eventually be releasing a 4K version of the, this film. So one final question from me, and I'd like you know, everyone to answer this one. What do you kind of think the legacy is of the Spectrum and why is it still held in such high regard and so warm to people's hearts to this day? Start with you, Jim. The Spectrum and the, the other machines at the time, which I won't name, um, they were sort of the, the birth of the, the games industry, especially in the UK, um, which the Spectrum was obviously the best in the UK. Um, and I think that's why the, the spectrum holds such a high well, people hold such a high regard for the spectrum because it's what we grew up with in you know, when the winters were really bad and it did rain so you just go inside and play and so it, it was great for kids um, you didn't have to do your homework because you <laughs> you always you would rather play jet set willy um, I thought I'd have to get that one in as well and so yeah it's I think it's because We've got so many memories of playing it as a kid, and and like over the years, I've had um, emails from people saying, you know, they they grew up playing my games as well as other people's games, but if if they'd had like a like a, a troubled childhood, and playing the games was their the only form of escapism, and plus the games were really good fun to play. So you, there's a lot of really good memories, really strong memories from your childhood. And that's, I think, where it comes from. For me, it was the machine that 
changed it from a bedroom industry to a proper commercial setting. It, it was the bootleg to the, the industry that we got today and it brought professionals like me. I, I was a programmer in industry and I could see, well, with this machine, I can make a living having fun. So I, I made that change. And because I did that, other people have followed my lead. I get loads of emails saying, because of you, I started programming. So there's a, at least a dozen programmers I know that I started off down the road and probably a lot more. And I wonder how many that they've inspired. So it was the start of quite a huge thing. For me, the, the, the best thing about the Spectrum is the fact that we're all here today. And it, it brings people like us together that we never normally would have met. So the fact that we're doing what we're doing today is down to the Sinclair doing what they did. It, the ZX80, ZX81, the Spectrum especially, the bedroom coders, it's the best thing ever. Well, I, I quite agree with you. It brings us all together. But I think Steve's point is really important. The Spectrum launched a whole generation of coders. It launched an industry in the UK which is still with us today. Uh, I was watching on television not so long ago a programme which claimed that the Margaret Thatcher's government put BBC computers into the school schools and that's what generated uh, the coders that we have working in the uh, games business today. And I thought, completely wrong. Completely wrong. There's nothing wrong with the BBC computer except for the price. Of course, the wonderful thing about the Spectrum was it was, I hate to say it, I hate to say cheap, shall we say cost effective. Affordable, a good word, affordable. Uh, and it, uh, as a result, loads of people, and we're all here, we're all here, uh, got on into this business. And the business is still with us today. Uh, you may know that my son has worked for TT Games, uh, producing the Lego, uh, some of the Lego film games, you know, Lego Star Wars and whatnot. And he's out there promoting uh, what he's working on now. But he's not alone. And, but this is a, a generational thing, that, la that launch with the, the, the ZX Spectrum. And it's something about what we're like here in the UK. We're a nation of early adopters. Uh, we took on the VHS video recorders back in the 1980s, and they saturated the market in the UK really quickly. We're exactly the same with mobile phones today. We are a nation of er early adopters. And the ZX Spectrum is part of that whole process of bringing people in and saying, you too, you too, can be part of this uh, great fun, which is what, in the end, we were all having. Like Jim, Steve, um, I, I obviously started as a bedroom coder, um, just knocking uh, games without the intention of having them sold. It was actually my father that took them to um, some shops, and then through there, Firebird got uh, got in touch, and it, it it allowed me to to make a living out of games. And then, if I, if I hadn't have been coding the bedroom and been able to do this sort of thing, I think I'd have been digging holes for a living. Simple as you know. People will say to me, "Oh, you know, I can't believe it. You know, the brain. You, you know, our brain." But that's it. I'd have been, you know, I'd have been working in a shop. It just gave the opportunity for us to make a living out of something that we really, really enjoyed doing. The nice thing was at the time was, uh, especially at the school that I went to, I went to the same school as Chris Kerry, who worked on games like Jack and the Beanstalk, we were able to share ideas. So, you know, the guys would show what they... Uh, and very often, to be honest, the reason there wasn't more coders out there was the fact that they'd look at what you were doing saying, oh, I'm going to scrap that thing I've just... I'm going to do something similar to yours. It's that little bit more advanced. Um, and the, certainly the school I went to, there would probably be about 20 potential game coders there. The thing was, they just didn't finish a game there was a handful of us that did finish a game. Uh, and it was an opportunity to send games to people like Andrew and make a couple of quid. You know, you'd be at school and, you know, these guys would say, well, you know, we'll give you 500, 1,000 quid, you know, if we release it. It was a lot of money to a 15-year-old kid. Um, you know, nowadays it's obviously a lot different, but then it was, it was, it was very easy to, to get into there as long as you did it the right way. You know, like the other guys said, it, it's like an industry and... An industry that's still going now, and we've got a, a, still a strong background of really good programmers in this country. And um, can't hear me. And uh, I mean, 35 years later, who can believe we're still talking about the Spectrum now? It's been that important to us all. Yeah, the Spectrum next coming out soon. So who knows? Next 35 years might be just as productive in the Spectrum world. Uh, for me, I think I got my Spectrum for my 14th birthday. So whatever you get into. 
uh, when you start to turn into a teenager, it's going to have a big effect on you. Um, so all those 14-year-old, all, everyone who was 14 in 1984 are now, you know, the same age as me and mid mid 40s. Um, so that's going to that's going to have a lasting effect on you. It's like whatever music you listen to as a teenager, you listen to it for the rest of your life. Um, and also the fact that because we didn't have any flashy graphics back then, uh, they had to make the games playable. Uh, and a game that was playable in 1984 will still be playable now as long as you can see past the old-fashioned looking graphics. Uh, and I think that's why they've a lot, I mean, they're not all really good. Some, that, you know, some of them were, were awful, but the really good ones have stood the test of time and they'll still be playable in a hundred years time as to whether anyone, anyone will be playing them, and I don't know. Um, for me, I think the spectrum is eternal. Do you remember that time when you were a child and everything was simple, your life was simple, and you had no worries like mortgages and bills and crap and credit cards. And, and for me, the spectrum is an umbilical to that simple, honest time when I was a child and uh, I had no problems in the world. And every time I touch it, I go back there. Okay, well, my, my view on the spectrum is it came out of the time that period of home computers was when you had people from almost what used to be a radio hobby, which turned into an electronics hobby in the UK. There's very much the background of where it came from. And I'm not an electronics or technical person at all, never have been, but as a, an art kind of creative designer guy, working with other people who are technical, this fusion of science and art, if you want, for a better reason, which we actually, on our original Sensible Software logo, we had half science and half art font. That was the concept, anyway. It's very much what it was. It was an effusion of a new art form. And uh, all of us, in our own ways, did different things. So people like Andrew facilitated publishing this stuff. We started making and experimenting with it. And, you know, I've been working in games now for over 30 years. But the Spectrum was my first step on that road. That's what I'm saying. So, and it was very British as well. I mean, we're all British, so we take it for granted. It was a very British experience made by an eccentric British uh, scientist in the first place. So it was great, and it kind of helped to put us as a country on the map. So that's the main thing that I love about the Spectrum. Well, you guys may have crossed paths at the time, and you've all kind of worked together. Have you got any good stories about each other at all? <laughs> any good memories? Yeah, um, when we came to interview John, um, he was developing um, his new soccer game and challenged me to a game. That was fair, wasn't it? And I think he was beating me 10-0 and I scored against him, and you've never met, seen a man so pissed off. Because <laughs> I dared, I dared to score a goal. It was a setup. Uh, any final questions from the audience for our panel before we show the movie? Just put your hand up if you've got a question. Can I, Andy, can I thank you for making the movie? And everyone else for taking part. I'm not going to ask a question, I just wanted to say it. All right, brilliant, thank you. Well, let's have a round of applause for our panel. <laughs>